So Tina, if I had a dollar for every time somebody says to me that sugar feeds cancer, how rich do you think I'd be? Pretty wealthy. Yeah. It's, you know, it's one of those things that where different cancer rumors kind of come and go. Mm-hmm. That sugar feeding cancer one, really, that that's kind of a constant. Yes. And it has to do with how cancer cells metabolize fuel in general. Well, it's it, it's an oversimplification, right? Yes. It's easy to take a grain of info and then just from there, just kind of like make it simple, make it sexy, make it scary. Make it polarizing. Yeah. Anyways, so yeah, you know, it's really one of those things and you see it all over the social media. You know, it's this constant thing about like sugar feeds cancer. Does sugar feed cancer? You know, avoid all sugar. I mean, people avoid all sugar. Some people will avoid fruit. They're like, oh yeah, I cut out all fruit and everything. Well, the cancer cells, if they're in someone's body, have no idea what you put in your mouth. They only know your blood sugar. They know your glucose. That's what goes streaming by your tumor or mixes with your cancer cells if they're in circulation. The point is, all you really want to know is your glucose in your bloodstream and how that affects cancer when it's present. It's more complicated than sugar feeds cancer. Well, that's what we're talking about today. We're going to be talking about does eating that piece of cake feed your cancer? Does eliminating all sugar, all carbs kill your cancer? I'm Dr. Tina Kayser, and as Leah likes to say, I'm the sciencey one. And I'm Dr. Leah Sherman, and I'm the Cancer Insider. And we're two naturopathic doctors who practice integrative cancer care. But we're not your doctors. This is for education, entertainment, and informational purposes only. Do not apply any of this information without first speaking to your doctor. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast by the hosts and their guests are solely their own. Welcome to the Cancer Pod. Okay, Tina, so what has made this sugar feeds cancer such a, I don't know, an enduring, I don't know if that's the right word, but how is this perpetuated? How has this rumor perpetuated over the years? You know, like I mentioned before, like, you know, there's some little grain of truth Mm -hmm. that gets oversimplified and people pick up on it and then they run. So like, where did this start? About a hundred years ago, there was a scientist named Otto Warburg and He claimed that cancer cells preferentially use glucose, and they'll do it in the presence of oxygen. He called this aerobic glycolysis. And glycolysis is when the cell uses glucose and creates energy. It's very inefficient. They don't get much energy per glucose molecule. Otto Warburg showed that cancer cells use glycolysis and that they prefer glucose as their fuel. And from that has come this idea over time that glucose, which is blood sugar, is how cancer cells are fueled. Wait, but like glucose is blood sugar? Yeah. So so just for the purposes of our listeners, when I say glucose, I mean blood sugar. When I say blood sugar, I mean glucose. So that's our primary sugar that is circulating. So it's been dubbed the Warburg effect because cancer cells prefer to use glucose is the premise. And table sugar is it's composed of glucose and fructose. Yes. And so that's probably, you know, people are like, oh, well, if cancer cells prefer glucose and my table sugar and the thing that sweetens my cake is made of glucose, therefore cake equals food for cancer. Glucose is our primary circulating sugar. But our body will create the glucose from a lot of different things. So you can eat all sorts of different carbohydrates. Um, We can even take the fructose and make glucose. Cancer cells are cells in our body. And so all cells in our body are like every, you know, all of our cells require glucose. Your body's going to find a way. If you're not eating table sugar or refined sugars, your body's going to find ways of producing glucose so that the rest of your body can continue running. It's going to find another source. Right. And your liver can create the glucose as well in the process gluconeogenesis. 
which is exactly what it sounds. Glucose, new, genesis, birthing it. So your, your liver can create glucose as well. Gluconeogenesis. And then that can lead us down the whole idea of the keto diet, but we're not going to go into that here. We're going to talk about what what do we actually know. So there is this hypothesis that Otto Warburg came up with 100 years ago, but what do we actually know in terms of the correlation between blood glucose and cancer? We know that the Warburg effect is an oversimplification and that cells can also use fatty acids for their fuel source. Some cancers will use amino acids for their fuel source. Most cancers can use multiple fuel sources, which is why you can't starve it. They're not going to starve if you have low blood glucose. There is an advantage to keeping your glucose low, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just because you're depriving the cells of their fuel. So without getting too deep into the biochemistry, when we say fuel, it's just the carbons. With sugar, every sugar is a is a ring of carbons. And it's kind of like your gas tank where you chew up the carbons in your combustion engine. Your cells chew up the carbon as a source of fuel. It's a carbon chain and the energy is derived from breaking it down and creating energy from it. And that's all you really need to know. And you can get those carbons from sugar, from glucose in your bloodstream. You can get it from fatty acids that go into the cell from your bloodstream. And you can get it from proteins. They all have a carbon backbone. The Warburg effect is not really very efficient. We think cancer cells that do use that system are doing it possibly because the efficient way to make energy also creates a lot of free radicals within the cell. And cancer cells don't do well with a lot of free radical generation. They are not capable of getting rid of those free radicals inside the cell. So that's poisonous to them in a way. But let's just say glucose isn't around. The cell is likely to be agile enough to use amino acids or fatty acids. So that means protein and fats. So you can't starve them because they have alternatives. That's ultimately what it comes down to. Because cancer, although it's stupid, is smart. I call it wily. Like it's wily like the coyote. coyote. It's, like yeah. coyote. <laughs> it's kind of dumb. Yeah. But it just, it, it, it keeps trying. Okay. So if sugar isn't you know, glucose isn't directly responsible for the development or growth of cancer, then why is it so important to control blood sugar? Well, we think it's influencing a lot of growth factors. And this could be something as simple as insulin, because there are more insulin receptors on many cancer cells than on normal cells. And that insulin can affect the growth of the cancer. Um, or insulin-like growth factors. When blood sugar goes high, that is glucose, that increases a lot of growth factors. And if something ends in growth factor, you probably don't want a lot of it circulating if there's cancer present. You don't want to spur the growth of cancer cells. And many cancer cells take advantage of growth factors in the body. The simplest one is insulin, but insulin-like growth factor is a close second, and there's others as well. So I would put that top of the list. And then in general, there is immune suppression with high glucose right? So that's that's just natural. There's immune suppression. And there is a low level of chronic inflammation when there is high glucose. And so um, when your glucose is high, you have effectively, you have higher circulating levels of estrogen, for example. And this has to do with the fact that estrogen, most estrogen is riding around on a bus <laughs> that we call sex hormone binding protein. And so this sex hormone binding protein really does. I mean, you just picture a bus with a bunch of people on it, you know, each of those persons is a is a different estrogen molecule. Usually when it's on the bus, it's not available. When glucose is high, you have less busing, you have more walkers, and that means your estrogen, <laughs> you know, your estrogen's free. It's free floating. It's able to bind receptors. So you when your glucose is high, the net effect is a higher estrogen circulating in your bloodstream. So it could be estrogen exposure for those that are estrogen receptor positive cancers or testosterone exposure for some of the, the androgen sensitive cancers. Um, so long story short, it's very clear in the literature that when the glucose is high, you have a higher risk of a lot of different cancers. And when blood sugars, blood glucose are, is high, you have a risk of metabolic syndrome, you have a risk of diabetes, type 2 diabetes. and there is some evidence, you know, albeit epidemiological, of the increased risk of certain cancers with type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. And those are like liver, pancreatic, endometrial, which is uterine, um, 
colon, breast, and bladder cancer. Yeah. And then maybe the most obvious, maybe it's something we should touch on too, is how the accumulation of calories by having high blood sugar, you're going to have to store that high blood sugar. The way you store glucose when it's high is in triglycerides in your liver. You deposit triglycerides in your liver. That's what we call a fatty liver. And that can be seen on imaging. So you can look at your CT scans, look at ultrasounds if you've ever had them. This will not be told to every person. Fatty liver is so common today in America that it's often not even told to the patient. You have to actually see it on the report because I've had many people look at the report and be like, what's this? It'll say on there that they have fat deposition in their liver. And I tell them it's because of excess glucose over the years. And you can break that down and get rid of it. But I'm just putting that out there because um, that's the first place it goes. And then, of course, you lay down fat in your body because then excess calories mean you're going to save it for some time. You're not going to have calories. That's what your body is doing when it lays down fat is waiting for your famine state because it perceives the excess calories as your feasting period. So that's the feast famine cycle that we're made for. And excess body fat has been implicated in the increased risk of multiple cancers, postmenopausal breast cancer is one, colorectal, endometrial, liver, pancreatic. So a lot of them are the same as that increased risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. But then also stomach cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian, head and neck cancers, kidney, gallbladder, esophageal. So there are a lot of cancers that carrying excess body fat, you know, can increase the risk of. And it's not necessarily obesity. It could be that maybe that that ratio that we've mentioned in other episodes of adipose tissue, fat tissue to lean muscle mass. And we're not saying that this is why you got cancer yourself, but it's just, you know, just because someone is thinner doesn't mean that their ratio of lean muscle mass to body fat isn't, you know, awry. And then increased body fat also increases inflammation. I think that's the, that's the key right there. The inflammatory state, the background systemic inflammatory state is higher if you have more adipose tissue and your ratio is off. So you can have a higher BMI and you can have some adipose tissue, you know, some fat on your body. But if there's muscle underneath, always remember muscle opposes fat as far as the inflammatory state goes. Your fat is creating molecules, literally in the fat cell, they're making, they're manufacturing molecules that increase inflammation. And inside your muscle cells, they're manufacturing molecules that oppose those. They're anti-inflammatory molecules. And so muscle opposes fat. The scale can say you have a higher BMI, technically you're overweight, but if you're carrying a lot of muscle and you might not appear overweight. You might be perfectly fine and normal and very healthy, especially if you have a good amount of muscle mass. So if you can't lose fat, then please build muscle. And that's what I, that's one of the things that I encourage patients to do um, mm -hmm. because patients are often told as they're going through treatment, depending on their stage of cancer, especially, or, or the type of cancer that they have is like, do not lose weight. And so when I talk about exercise, they're like, well, I was told I'm not supposed to lose weight. I'm like, I'm not trying to get you to lose weight. I'm trying to get you to increase your muscle mass. It helps with decreasing inflammation. It helps with maintaining better blood glucose regulation. Um, but it also helps with balance. And it helps with you know people being able to do their day-to-day -day things that they want to continue doing to create as much of a you know normal life as you're able to create while you're going through treatment. And if you like to eat, the more muscle mass you have, the more your body chews up calories when you're not even moving. So this is one of the reasons that men can eat a lot of calories they can lose weight very quickly because they have a larger amount of muscle mass. And that means that they're idle. I call it like you're idle. I keep using the car analogy apparently today, but like what they're just idling. <laughs> it's car they're, talk. It's, it's car, car talk with Tina and Leia. <laughs> but when they're just sitting there idling, they're watching a game on TV or they're sleeping, you know, whatever we're doing. If you have more muscle mass, you're actually chewing up more calories at rest. Your basal metabolism is chewing up more calories. So if you like to eat, that's a good reason to put on muscle mass because you get to eat more <laughs> and not gain the fat. All right. So let's take a break. And then when we come back, we will continue to talk about things that people can do to help to regulate their blood sugars and maybe a little bit more about like why I might tell a patient or you might tell a patient to rein in their sugar intake. And I'm going to talk about 
those artificial sweeteners too. Ooh, more controversy. All right, we'll be right back. All right, Leo. So we talked about the Warburg hypothesis. We talked about muscle and fat ratios on the body and many cancers that are associated with too much glucose. But let's talk about what are we going to do about it? What is your take when a patient asks you about sugar? What's kind of your messaging? So I talk about, I don't talk about the Warburg effect. I don't get, <laughs> I don't get that deep. That's just me. <laughs> that's, that's your thing. But I do talk about how it is an oversimplification of some, you know, fact And then I kind of tell them why I do recommend decreasing refined sugar and refined carbohydrate intake, because there is more benefit to things that people can identify like immediately. So I talk about fatigue. So when people are tired, you know, they might have a Coke or a coffee with lots of sugar and, you know, or that three o'clock, I'm starting to crash. I'm going to have like a donut or, you know, some sort of a sweet snack that just perpetuates the fatigue because your blood sugar is going to increase and then it's going to crash and then you're going to be tired again. And so for patients going through treatment, I mean, fatigue is major. And so why do things that are just going to perpetuate, give you that quick fix? I mean, and sometimes you need that quick fix. Um, but in the long run, it's not going to be helpful. Um, I also talk about the hot flash aspect where having dysregulated blood sugar, can contribute to more hot flashes. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, it's kind of nice when you see patients kind of making that aha moment on their own. When I ask them to start tracking like the correlation between hot flashes and what they eat or they don't eat because that blood sugar is going to become dysregulated if you skip a meal. And so, yeah, I just kind of put it into those kind of real, real life situations that are, you know, more identifiable. The big thing that I say is, you know, like if, you want to have dessert. If you want to have sugar, just have it with a meal. Don't have it as a meal. And so that's kind of that idea of that naked carbs. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of a sexy term, naked carbs. Um, but that's eating refined sugar, refined carbs on their own without including protein, fat, and fiber, which can help to slow down your body's you know, use of the sugar in that food product anyways. And so if you eat supper, save room for dessert, and then have your dessert right afterwards, your body's going to metabolize that sugar better than if you wait an hour or two. And then right before bed, you have your scoop of ice cream. It's just different. That's an important point because your stomach is a holding tank of sorts. And it is not where your glucose and your sugar is absorbed. It's absorbed in your small intestine. And so while your stomach has supper in it, you then put in the last bits of sugar on top of the fat, fiber, and protein. And then when it gets all released, it all gets released slowly into the small intestine, your blood sugar slowly goes up instead of the rapid rise it would have and there's nothing in your stomach to buffer it. So when when naked carbs, I like the term naked carbs, when naked carbs are <laughs> eaten. <laughs> sexy, sexy. <laughs> when those naked carbs are taken in, um, the stomach becomes more of a pit stop. It's, it doesn't hold carbohydrate. What, what causes your stomach to stop and churn and secrete the acid is the other component. So it's fat, it's protein. Um, if it's a really simple carbohydrate, it goes right through the stomach and into the small intestine nearly immediately. This is why when people are hypoglycemic, when someone is diabetic and they're having a massive hypoglycemia, that's why they do juice, right? And this is a super simple carbohydrate naked, nothing else around it. You do some apple juice or whatever, orange juice, and boom, the blood sugar goes, jumps right back up. And so it's an important rescue. And in that, you have an example of how fast something that is pure sugar goes into your bloodstream. You can see it in someone who's diabetic and does a, a quick jolt of a sugar. That's how fast it goes into your system. It's, it's nearly immediate because there's nothing else around it. If they stopped and took a bite of a, uh, a burrito... <laughs> It would take too long. It wouldn't long. happen. It would take too long. That's not a rescue. You can't rescue people with a taco. So, at least not from low blood sugar. Well, like you know, a hypoglycemic event. Right now, if it's a hangover, it's a whole other story. So, uh, you know, something else that I do mention with patients, which is kind of an important thing, is having that blood sugar reaction right before bedtime. 
can lead to interrupted sleep. And so that's something else. That's another real life situation that I talk about to help them see how regulating your blood sugar across the board, you know, and that includes if they are type two diabetic, make sure that they are, you know, taking their medications and all of that. So, so when you say that you're talking about that roller coaster of the, the eating sugar and then crashing, and then in the crash state, you want to reach for sugar because it makes you feel better quickly. And you get on this up and down roller coaster of high and low blood sugar. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's very common. Oh yeah. I mean, that's really what that three o'clock crash is, right? Yes. I used to do that all the time when I lived in New York, you know, three o'clock, you go out and you get your, your coffee and your whatever sweet treat. Yeah. And generally speaking, if you are crashing two and three o'clock, it's because your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is not healthy. And so there's a whole much deeper issue with your blood sugar that needs to be addressed because your adrenal glands are one of the organs that helps control blood sugar throughout the day. And so it's a deeper issue. Um, And it's very common because we work in excess, we're stressed out, and we don't get enough sleep in general. With that combination, the HPA axis is often taxed, and that leads to that midday crash that people have and go out and get some kind of stimulant to get through. And so that also can lead to taking in excess calories, right? So limiting excess calories is really important in general. And, you know, again, a lot of these apply not only to to cancer, but it applies to other chronic conditions. Right. So just in general, just limiting limiting excess calories. And that's, you know, portion size is is huge. And I'm completely guilty of overindulging in portion size, um, eating too fast, which is my, I don't know, that's my, my downfall. Mm. You don't have time to, your body doesn't have time to kind of recognize how much you've actually eaten. You know, if you're not chewing your food well, you can tend to overeat Mm -hmm. because your body, your brain hasn't quite registered like, oh, wait, I'm actually full. You just keep going. Yeah. So regardless of what you're eating, if you eat in excess, your glucose is more likely to go too high. And and we should be clear also, glucose is supposed to go up after a meal. This is how we feed our body. So, you know, it's also a normal process. We just don't want it to be excessively high. And you want to be able to come back down to baseline where you started. You don't want to crash. Yeah. Yes. The crash means that you go, let's say your baseline is 90 and you go and have a meal that goes up to 140. We call it a crash if you're now you go down to 70, right? After your meal, like it's an hour and a half, two hours after your meal, you're feeling like you crashed because it went down lower than where you started. That's a hypoglycemia for that person. Have you ever done one of those glucose tolerance tests? Not on myself, no. So, one thing that when somebody is out shopping, you know, we we tend to discourage those processed, ultra processed foods. But one good thing to look at when purchasing anything that's packaged that has a label is look at the sugar content and the fiber content of the food. And so anything that has like a really low fiber content, and I probably should have a number and I don't have a number in my head. Um, like what would your limit be for a product? I don't look at numbers. I just get ratios. Well, what would a ratio? I mean... I would say avoid foods with high sugar, low fiber. That means anything that tastes sweet and has no fiber. So that includes the juices. That includes soda pop. So when looking at a package of food, you know, the first ingredient, if it's any kind of a sweetener, whether it's high fructose corn syrup or, you know, white sugar, whatever, brown sugar, whatever it may be, also look to see what the fiber content is. Well, first of all, if sugar is the first ingredient, that's probably candy. So, (laughs) but maybe there are, maybe there's some energy bars that are super high in sugar. You want to make sure that it's got high fiber too. So fiber is really important, like you're saying, to help to slow down the body's ability to break down and metabolize sugar. Um, One thing that I recently found with the patient was they were really nauseated, not doing too well. I think they're like having a lot of vomiting and diarrhea. And they so they started drinking a lot of electrolyte drinks. And I don't remember which one it was, but it was one that had super, super high sugar in it. Mm-hmm. And they were drinking multiple ones a day. And they'd been doing that for a long time because they'd been experiencing nausea over a long period of time. And they're like, I just keep gaining weight. And then we realized that the drink, the whatever electrolyte drink that they were having and also this person had cut out pop, right? They're, so they cut mm. out soda pop 
thinking they were doing a good thing and they chose an electrolyte drink that just happened to have a ton of sugar in it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, look for hidden sugars like that. That You know, that's that's interesting because when I was growing up and I had a little tummy ache, I remember distinctly sugar in warm water was the remedy. Oh, that's wild. We did ginger ale. We did flat ginger ale for upset stomach. Flat ginger ale. And, you know, this is why Pepsi was invented. Pepsi is pep, meaning stomach. Pepsid, Pepsigen, it's a pep, meaning the stomach. Pepsi was originally made for stomach upset. But I don't think that was the sugar part of it. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe sugar alleviates a little bit of the stomach upset is my my point. I can't believe you're getting sugar water. (laughs) When I was a kid. It's your secret life as a hummingbird. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, so if if you're able, make sure that, you know, it, in your packaged food that there is a lower added sugar content and a higher fiber content. Yeah, and that that goes for natural foods too. So even juices and stuff. I mean, you want you can do whatever you want to do as far as juices, just make sure that you have something else going down at the same time, some protein, some fiber you know, that kind of thing. So, Oh, yeah. And with juices, um, definitely, if somebody is juicing themselves, make sure that you're adding some fiber back in or using some sort of a juicer that doesn't extract all of the fiber or limit the amount that you're drinking because that's another big trend is to have like a huge tall glass of some sort of like mixed fruit and vegetable juice Mm -hmm. um, as a meal. And so kind of limiting how much fresh juice or you know, if you're going to drink a bottled juice, um, just limiting how much you're having that. And then again, unless you're diabetic and it's an emergency, have it with a meal. Yeah. And the last bit on controlling your blood sugar is to keep moving, to use it. Because remember that glucose in your bloodstream is looking for somewhere to go. And if you are moving, exercising, doing something, you just gave that glucose somewhere to go. It goes into the cell and it gets used as fuel. And that gives you the energy to move the muscles or your heart to pump faster or what have you during your exercise period. And it could be as simple as just taking a walk after a meal. I mean, like that's kind of ideal, right? You you have a meal and then go for a walk. Yeah. And so when you mention the dessert after supper, if you are so inclined and you don't mind doing this and you ha- do want that sweet treat every day, you're better off doing it at lunch and then going for a walk or at lunch and then keeping active. Because often after supper, we wind down and we start to slow down. And it's probably better to put anything that's going to cause more glucose to be done when you're active. So do it just before you go for a hike. Or if you're going to the coffee house and you want to have that chocolate croissant, do that and then take a take a walk or go up the hill or something. Um, I had a gentleman. <laughs> he was in his 80s. And he was a farmer. and He had type 2 diabetes. He was just, you know, he said, I'm 80-something years old. I don't want to take any medications. So, you know, that's his prerogative. He said he controlled his blood sugar because he tested it regularly. He controlled it with diet. And when it would go too high, he had a boom box in his barn. And he'd hit go. And he played, I don't know what kind of music he played, but he would just dance. He's like 20, 30 minutes of dancing, and I bring it right down. So there you go. Oh, I love dance for exercise, and I, I'm sure we've talked about it before. Yeah, I have used to write prescriptions for people to dance. I thought it was great. That's awesome. Because he deduced it on his own, and it was his medicine. He's like, you know, there's so many other benefits, of course, to dancing. You know, Everybody's got their song. Everyone has that one song that will get them moving. So yep. yeah, I think um, another thing is if you're going to have a high refined carb meal. If you're going to have something like pasta, you know, reduce the size of the pasta, include more vegetables, maybe some sort of lean protein, whether it's beans or chicken. But you can also have that pasta meal, like you're saying, in the middle of the day. And then have something maybe lighter or, you know, less refined carby Mm -hmm. for supper. So, and I've, I've had patients that do that too. When they're able to shift their meals around Um, And, you know, pasta is super easy, super quick. And if you cook your pasta al dente, there's less carbohydrate available. So one of the things that is generally done in Italy is you you want a firm pasta, right? You don't want it to be cooked all the way through and super gooey or mushy. So if you cook it al dente, what you're creating are 
carbohydrates that cannot be broken down. So there's still a little leftover goes through the colon. And these, in general, you have this from potatoes, you get this from legumes. These are parts of the starches that are not digestible that go on to feed your good bacteria in your gut. And so these undigestible starches are actually a healthy thing. So they're actually good to have. So if you are going to do pasta, cook it al dente, and it makes it less caloric, and it feeds your good gut bugs. And don't and, and I think the the big takeaway is also it doesn't need to be your whole meal. And I know it tends to be in the United States. Um, it's more of a side dish. Like <laughs> my dad was one of these people where he could have pasta with any meal, like as a side dish. It just was his mm-hmm. the thing that he loved the most. Um, but yeah, it it can be a side dish and does not necessarily need to be the main attraction for the meal. So what we're talking about so far is working with whole foods, right? And sweet treats. And in, if you have a sweet treat and you have a dessert, we're picturing, you know, homemade cobbler or pie or something that has whole ingredients in it. We're not talking about candy bars. We're not talking about things that are artificial. And hey, I, I did a post the other day that as I was making my supper, I had a muffin. And that was not something I made myself. That was a Trader Joe's coffee cake muffin. Okay. But it was whole food, right? It wasn't artificially sweetened. Oh, I don't think so. No, 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 no. It had sugar in it. And that's why I ate it before my meal, because then I had my meal to kind of balance everything out. So I'm saying this because when you and I talk about food, we are talking about real food not synthetic foods, not artificial foods, real food. And in the realm of real food, there's there's only a, a certain bandwidth of sweetness that can happen. Even if you concentrate it, even if it's sugar, you can only it can only be so sweet and it can only be so salty if you're within nature. Now, when you get to processed food, when you get to artificial sweeteners, It goes beyond anything nature has created. And that means that NutraSweet, saccharin, name it, whatever, the the artificial sweetener is. I don't even care if it's um, stevia. Stevia. Yeah, stevia is super sweet. It is because they concentrated it. If you take a stevia leaf, that would be different. People aren't using stevia leaves when they use stevia. They're using a powdered concentrate that's closer to a saccharin. They're not just taking the leaf and they're extracting it. They're extracting it and making it sweeter. So I'm saying this because the taste of sweet things is relative to what you've been eating. Your palate perceives sweetness relative to what you've eaten, mostly for the last six weeks, but roughly the last three months. So, for example, if you drink a Pepsi a day and then you have an oatmeal cookie homemade from my kitchen, (laughs) that oatmeal cookie is probably going to taste like cardboard to you because it's not going to taste sweet because your idea of sweet is cola. And it's so sweet that when you eat something that's slightly sweet or even blueberries are less sweet or an apple would be less sweet, you might perceive the sweetness, but it's not as sweet as it would be if you didn't have extreme sweet in the prior six weeks to three months. So my my point about this is I am really, I dislike artificial sweeteners. I don't like them. I don't think they're, I mean, they're right in the name artificial they're not natural. They're nothing that the body has seen. I don't think we're biologically equipped for them. I don't care what the research says. There was, interestingly, some, some experiment recently, I believe it was in the proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, that talked about aspartame specifically. And aspartame has a sordid history. That's NutraSweet, right? Yeah, aka NutraSweet. When it came out, everyone knew, everyone who's natural- medicine minded, everyone who's nature minded, I suppose. You look at it, you see what it's metabolized down to. You're like, that can't be a good thing. I don't know. I mean, it's just you can't sell me on this artificial molecule being a good idea because one of the metabolites is methanol. Now, granted, there's not a lot of methanol because you're not taking a lot in, but methanol, eh, it's not a great molecule to be ingesting. So you ingest this aspartame molecule, you break it down to a few different molecules in your body. One of them happens to be methanol, which is nasty. And yeah, it's not good for you. I'm not going to go into great detail. There are other studies showing that it's, as far as cancer goes, it's linked to lymphomas um, specifically. And now granted, it's in mice because that's who we can give a lot of this stuff to 
right? We can't just line up people or college students and say, here, take a, two cups of aspartame and see what happens. <laughs> That's not ethical. Um, but we can do it to the mice. So a lot of the studies are in animals, which means that they don't get taken seriously. But me, I'm more of a, you know, I'm a, I'm a naturopath and it's not natural. And biologically, you're adding a new molecule to a biological system that is the human in this case. And that's an experiment. I don't think it should be done if you can help it. And when you eat an artificial sweetener, my point also is that you're extending the sweetness palate. You are now eating something that is so sweet. And this includes stevia, I'm sorry to say. It's so sweet on your palate that when you go to eat natural sweetness from nature, from fruits, for example, they don't taste as sweet as they would if you didn't do that to your tongue. And speaking of things not tasting as sweet, when somebody's going through treatment and they lose their sense of taste, sweet is often the last one to go. And so that is also the big attraction of when you're going through treatment of why sweets are more appealing mm -hmm. because that might be the, the, the last taste bud standing. Oh, mm -hmm. So, you know, so if you were to do something with blueberries, you know, like, okay, I'm going to do a blueberry smoothie. Um, it might not have the same taste that if you weren't going through treatment, it would have because you're, you might not be picking up all of that sweetness. And, I, you know, considering everything we just said, my solution to that, if people are, if someone says, I just want to really, I just want to be able to taste it, lean towards the natural sweeteners. Look at maple syrup, look at honey, look at, you know, things that are naturally sweet concentrates and, and the fruits as well. Um, I would probably lean towards that just knowing that it's better for someone. And of course, you put some fiber in there or something to slow down the sugar. Yeah. And, you know, healthy fats and fiber, right? You're, tr you're trying to incorporate it with some protein, healthy fat and fiber. Yeah. And during treatment time, there's so many things going in the body, more chemical compounds, because that's what artificial sweeteners are. They're chemicals. I don't see how that's ever going to be a great idea, you know? And I, I think I'm, I'm probably, if, if people are having a um, emotional reaction to this discussion, because it's not good news. I mean, it's not fun to tell people that something's not good for you. Um, yeah, it's kind of don't shoot the messenger, I suppose. Take. I was going to say, take it up with Tina. I can take it. Our email is thecancerpod at gmail dot com. <laughs> okay, so so what are our take home points? Let's 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 wrap this thing up. Okay, so our take home points are try to keep that blood glucose in a normal range, mm -hmm. and that can be from. Um, you know, like we're saying, like incorporating fat, protein, fiber, all of those with your meals and your snacks. You might have to snack every couple hours, you know, to kind of keep that that level going, especially if you are on, let's say, steroids or something that's going to artificially move your blood sugar levels. So that's kind of the number one, the number one take up point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Build muscle. Because muscle will always help you control glucose better and control your systemic inflammation better. And, you know, when you're exercising, it's also good for mood. And when you're in a state where you can be building muscle, please consider that as part of blood glucose control because there's no downside to that, right? And then kind of what I touched on in the first take-home point is no naked carbs. Yeah. Try you not know, to do have... that sugaries, yeah, by themselves. Yeah, have your... Have your dessert before you have your supper, <laughs> but don't overeat. Um, but yeah, you know, make sure that you're incorporating all of those other nutrients if you are going to partake. And the one thing that we will always tell people is to eat your vegetables as much as you want. Vegetables tend to be lower in carbohydrates. So go ahead and eat your veggies. Um, no problems there. You just have to be careful of the sweet stuff and especially processed. So on that note, I'm Dr. Leah Sherman. And I'm Dr. Tina Kayser. And this is The Cancer Pod. Until next time. Thanks for listening to The Cancer Pod. Remember to subscribe, review, and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media for updates. And as always, this is not medical advice. These are our opinions. Talk to your doctor before changing anything related to your treatment plan. The Cancer Pod is hosted by me, Dr. Leah Sherman, and by Dr. Tina Kayser. Music is by Kevin McLeod. See you next time.
Wee, 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 wee.